Welcome once again, agents. Did you know that it's statistically impossible for us to be alone in the universe? What happens when statistics catch up to a civilization unprepared for contact? Item number SCP-163 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-163's enclosure consists of four adjoining rooms, three meters from floor to ceiling, with the following attributes. One 5 meter by 5 meter receiving room with an airlock and seating appropriate for both SCP-163's and human morphology. One 5 meter by 3 meter storage room capable of storing SCP-163's isolation suit, tools, and games. One 20 meter by 50 meter workshop and dining area which contains all salvage technology, including SCP-163-1. 1 5 meter by 5 meter sleep area and rest facility, furnished with seating and bedding feeding SCP-163's morphology. Air is filtered into the enclosure, and is automatically monitored at all times by computer and once daily by staff, to check for impurities. Filters are to be changed weekly or any time impurities are found in the air. Two separate lighting systems are used in the enclosure, one which produces radiation between 400 nanometers and 700 nanometers, and one that produces radiation before 150 nanometers and 300 nanometers. The primary lighting system may be turned on and off at SCP-163's discretion. At no point are forbidden elements and chemicals to be introduced into the enclosure above prescribed proportions listed in manual M-163-1. Personnel and any items brought with them will be checked for traces of these chemicals prior to be allowed access to the enclosure. Personnel are to wear isolation suits at all times while in the enclosure to protect themselves and SCP-163 from gross contamination. Before being granted clearance to enter the enclosure, personnel are to study manual M-163-2 and submit to an interview with doctor. Clearly personnel are permitted to interact with SCP-163 by assisting it with repair of equipment and by playing board games with it. SCP-163 may leave its enclosure at any time. It must first announce its intent to leave the enclosure through an agreed-upon gesture and don its isolation suit. The suit contains the same air filters used to cycle the air in the enclosure. In order to facilitate vision, SCP-163 may carry an UV flashlight capable of producing radiation wavelengths of no less than 280 nanometers in order to keep risk of skin cancer among personnel to a minimum. When roaming the facility, SCP-163 is to be accompanied by a junior researcher who is to record all actions, gestures, and expressions with a video camera. The escort is to also bar SCP-163 from any areas deemed dangerous to it. Once every three days, personnel are to deliver to the receiving room a 20-liter container with chemical elements in proportions listed in manual M-163-1. SCP-163 will take the container and pour its contents into SCP-163-1. The empty container is then placed in the airlock for retrieval. Equipment may be removed from the enclosure only when in the presence of SCP-163. If SCP-163 interferes with the removal of a piece of equipment, the item is to be placed back in the area from which it was taken. At no point is SCP-163-1 to be disassembled, operated, or moved by personnel under any circumstances. Any attempt to do so will result in severe discipline. Description: SCP-163 is a sapient organism of extraterrestrial origin. When standing, it is 2 meters tall and 1.5 meters wide, the bulk of the body being suspended 50 centimeters from the ground. The body is roughly cylindrical, with a circular mouth at the bottom, the equivalent of a head at the top, and eight three-jointed legs arranged radially around the equator. SCP-163 also has a series of specialized limbs listed here. Two prehensile feeding apparatus on either side of the mouth. Two arms near the top of the body, used for delicate manipulation. Two larger arms located closer to the legs, used for heavy manipulation and lifting, and capable of producing a steady force of approximately 500 newtons and a striking force of up to 2000 newtons. 
two appendages of indeterminate function located between the legs and mouth parts, which had been amputated prior to SCP-163's discovery. 30 centimeters from the top of the body is a single semi-compound eye, which extends in a ring around it, allowing a full 360 degrees of vision. There is a blind spot at the back of the head, to make way for an organ used for elimination of bodily waste. The compound eye is separated into 88 units. The most likely hypothesis is that each unit receives only vertical information, while the brain intuits horizontal information by comparing input from the different units. The eye is sensitive to light wavelengths between 150 nm and 300 nm, equivalent to UVC, which is harmful to most terrestrial life. SCP-163 contains an endoskeleton which consists of tissue similar in chemical composition and structure to cellulose. The skeletal structure protrudes from the uppermost joint of each leg and appears to have been blunted by mechanical means. No pain response is exhibited when samples are taken from these protrusions. The skin is transparent to visible wavelengths of light, but opaque to ultraviolet. Blood samples taken have an oxygen and carbon dioxide transport system based on nickel, rather than the iron or copper used by terrestrial organisms, and is green in color. Analysis of blood and tissue shows that SCP-163 cells use DNA for instruction, with the standard GCAT basis. However, a different method is used to interpret said instructions. Sets of three bases still code for amino acids, but they are not the same ones that are coded for in terrestrial cells. In addition, some terrestrial amino acids are not present in its biology, while others that it uses are not present in Earth's biosphere, allowing for dramatically different protein arrangements. SCP-163's home environment would have contained different proportions of elements compared to that of Earth. This is evidenced by its sensitivity to certain common elements and its resistance to other less common ones. A heavy metal poisonous to terrestrial life is used in SCP-163's metabolism. Iron and calcium, though not used by SCP-163, causes no harmful effects to it. Exposure to any chemical form causes damage to tissue and are as harmful to SCP-163 as they are to us. A full table of safe and unsafe chemicals, along with dietary requirements, is contained in manual M163-1. Furthermore, the atmosphere would have had different proportions of gases. SCP-163 is able to survive in our atmosphere for some time without mechanical aid, but will begin to show signs of illnesses after one hour. Air that is filtered to remove certain common terrestrial elements will prevent such an event. Analysis of SCP-163's technology includes searches for hermetically sealed chambers which may contain evidence of its home atmosphere. It is unknown how SCP-163 communicates complex ideas. The only vocalization produced by it is a steady sinusoidal wave of approximately 15 Hz when in certain emotional states. There is no variation to this vocalization, which can last from 15 seconds to 10 minutes. It is recommended that personnel exposed to this sound remain in well-lit conditions to prevent feelings of paranoia. Emotions are primarily displayed by the dome of tissue about the compound eye. Different states correspond to distortions or furrows in the skin by subdermal muscles. In addition, a negative and affirmative gesture have been noted. An affirmative consists of the rapid beating together of SCP-163's delicate manipulators, while a negative is the same gesture performed by heavy manipulators. Specific information on gestures and emotional states is contained in manual M163-2. SCP-163-1 appears to be a universal life support device. It is able to convert basic chemical elements into substance for SCP-163, in addition to originally projecting the phenomenon in which SCP-163 was found. To ensure the continued health of SCP-163, study of SCP-163-1 is forbidden until after the death of SCP-163. The function of other equipment is still not fully understood. The technology is limited to crude transistors, assembled into various specialized analog computers. 
Many physical processes that these computers model do not correspond to anything known to modern science. It is theorized that SCP-163-1 relies on some of these processes in order to function. SCP-163 was first discovered by miners in the Andes Mountains on 20. The rock strata in which it was found are approximately years old. Shock minerals in the vicinity indicate that each spacecraft had crash landed. The miners reported coming across an impenetrable mirror surface which abruptly disappeared after enough rock was removed from it. The description suggests that this is a larger version of the phenomenon produced by SCP-163-1. Despite being encased in stone for years, the contents of the chamber showed no sign of age or degradation, believed to be an effect of the phenomenon. Approximately 30% of the equipment had been looted before agents could reach the scene. Though some have been since recovered, there are many items still at large. Agents are continuing to scour the black market for any future clues as to the whereabouts of the missing technology. When agents took control of the scene, SCP-163 was still encased in the reflective sphere produced by SCP-163-1. The relative simplicity of SCP-163-1's interface allowed agents to quickly deactivate it. Agents were forced to subdue SCP-163, which was violent at the time. Aside from this initial confrontation, SCP-163 has cooperated with the Foundation to the extent of its ability to understand us. The following are select experiments performed on SCP-163. A full list of experiments and results is contained in Manual M-163-2. Experiment Log 163-46 Facial Recognition Date 20 Subject SCP-163 Procedure Doctor Enter the enclosure of SCP-163 carrying 30 11 by 17 cards with images printed on them with UV absorbing inks. Images were representations of human faces of varying complexity. SCP-163 was shown these images from least complex, a smiley face, to most complex, a photograph of doctor. Details SCP-163 was not able to recognize the smiley face, which human infants are able to immediately emulate. It was not until the 18th image that SCP-163 reacted by taking the card and placing it over the front of Dr. Faceplate. Image 18 had exaggerated facial features which included a nose, eyes, ears, and an open mouth, showing a row of straight teeth. Image 17 was identical, but with a closed mouth. Experiment Law 163-47 Facial Recognition Date 20. Subject SCP-163 Procedure Doctor Enter the SCP-163's enclosure carrying 20 11 by 17 cards with images printed on them with UV absorbing inks. Images were representations of the top of SCP-163's body, ranging in complexity from an isosceles triangle to a photograph of SCP-163. Details SCP-163 did not recognize the first card as a member of its species. The second card, depicting an isosceles triangle with an horizontal line going through the middle, elicited a response. SCP-163 took all of the cards from Doctor and looked at each in turn. It then sorted the cards into two stacks, one which contained six images, including image 1, and one which contained the reminder, including image 2. It is hypothesized that the first stack includes images which cannot be recognized as SCP-163 species, while the second stack has images that can. The presence of the photograph in the second stack supports this hypothesis. Experiment Law 163-80 Altruism Test Date 20 Subject SCP-163 Procedure Doctor Enter the enclosure, carrying two wooden blocks and a box capable of holding both. Doctor, open the box and move one block into it while feigning great effort. After closing the box, Doctor, 
moved the second block toward it, again feigning effort, and waited a response from SCP-163. Details. SCP-163 opened the box for Dr. After 10 seconds of him attempting to place the block inside while the lid was closed. The result is consistent with the same experiment performed on human and children. Experiment Law 163-88 Higher Functions Date 20 Subject SCP-163 Procedure Doctor Enter the enclosure with a card containing an easel, five canvases, assorted brushes, and a selection of pigments which reflect different ultraviolet frequencies between 100 nm and 300 nm. Doctor briefly demonstrated the act of painting using three of these pigments before handling the brush to SCP-163. Details SCP-163 immediately began painting with the provided pigments. The image produced was of a landscape containing unrecognizable plants and animals, according to UV imaging. SCP-163 remained still for 7 minutes after completing the painting before knocking it from its easel and retreating to a corner of the receiving room. Cranial ridges indicated distress. All further attempts at interacting with SCP-163 failed until Dr. attempted to remove the painting supplies from the enclosure. At that point, SCP-163's heavy manipulators were protruded from between its legs and indicated a negative gesture. The following day, SCP-163 was seen painting on a new canvas. Of the end of 163-88 As of this date, fresh canvases, paints and brushes should be provided to SCP-163 whenever its supplies begin to go low. This is the first truly meaningful communication we have been able to understand. At the very least, we may be able to learn more about the ecology of its homeworld. Doctor At the end of 163-93 The odds of SCP-163 having been discovered at all are mind-boggling given the size of the Earth. A number of factors would have had to come into play, including plate tectonics, development of terrain by humans, and just plain old dumb luck. I am feeling a recommendation that all excavations of yield or strata be monitored by agents for more members of SCP-163 species. I find it hard to believe that we just happened to come across the only single spacecraft that Christ landed on Earth millions of years ago. At that time, when we are just beginning to develop the capacity to recognize the importance of such a find. There must be others hidden in stasis somewhere down there. Doctor In Law An anomaly whose cover-up actually makes sense. In a rare show of humanity, the Foundation has opted to try to communicate with the extraterrestrial entity instead of treating it like a toy for experimentation. These types of anomalies, which pose a low but latent risk to themselves and others, best exemplify the GOC's principle of concealment. We will monitor the Foundation's progress and be ready to intervene if their intentions go beyond simple protection and concealment, or if they try to use this being lost in time and space for their own benefit. Help us continue uncovering anomalies with your suggestions below. I am Virus Trisonimo, we at the GOC, and you have been informed.